in the resurrection, you know, the the the, the resurrection, the, the 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 final day, the the, the final you know form of, of of the kingdom. It's not just going to be a bunch of spirits run, you know floating around or anything like that. There's going to be again glorified believers who are going to have bodies that share the same stuff as the resurrected Christ's body, and even as of God himself when God chose to be embodied uh, in the Old Testament. It would be incorruptible, but it would be corporeal in some sense as well. Now, at times during the episode, and I'll try to remember to, to telegraph this specifically, uh, I'm going to be quoting from uh, what I think is probably the, the best book on this subject. and it's, it's a recent scholarly work. The dissertation is not available, or else I would have included it in the bibliography, the Divine Council bibliography. That is not available in PDF, so we really only have the book, and the book's expensive. Uh, the book is called, uh, it, it's by a guy named M. David Litwa, that's L-I-T-W-A, and the book is called We Are Being Transformed. Subtitle is Deification in Paul's Soteriology. And for those not familiar with the term soteriology, that's Paul's doctrine of salvation. So the doctrine of salvation goes from you know conversion all the way up to glorification in traditional theology classes. And so Litwa's book is, again, about the whole, not, not, not the whole scope, but specifically the deification element, the glorification element. And he has a full chapter on the bodies of gods uh, in both Jewish texts, Greco-Roman texts, and he has a few other chapters that sort of build off that one. So he, he probably devotes 50, 60, 70 pages to this spiritual body concept, which is more than I've you know, seen anyone else do, and, and again, it was this was published in 2012, so it's very current with the literature as well. So I would recommend it. Again, it, it's pricey, and I don't really have a way to, to get you the dissertation that this uh, was based on. Let me just take a look here, I, because I think it is actually the published version of a dissertation. Well, it's actually not. It's just, it's just a monograph, so it's something he's been working on for a while. So that would explain why it's not in the dissertation database. But again, if you want the book, you're going to have to get the book. And it's, it's the best thing on the topic, but it's pricey. Again, I'll be honest with you. But what, what you know, Lit was arguing and what Paul is saying is that, look, all this language about being conformed to, the, to, to Christ, you have to include in it that we are conformed to his heavenly body as well. And he goes on, he says, this is explicitly stated in Philippians 3.21, quote, he will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to his body of glory. And again, look, look at the words. The glory in the Old Testament, in certain texts, has bodily human form. So I'm going to read that again, Philippians 3.21. He will, you know, God will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to his body of glory. Litwa says, what we learn in 1 Corinthians 15.45 is that Christ's body is not only a body of glory, but also a body of pneuma. So this idea of a spirit body is not a spirit spirit, okay? It's not formless. It's not energy. It's not light. Okay, it actually is some corporeal stuff, like Jesus had post-resurrection. Uh, again, it, it's a hard concept, you know, for us to wrap our minds around. But what the argument is here is that don't be misled by the by the terminology "spirit body," as though it, it lacks definite form and shape and constitution. Again, what Paul is getting at based upon, again, the embodiment language for the glory of God back in the Old Testament, is that we're, we're going to have bodies, okay? But, but, but our bodies are going to be like the, the, you know, the way God was embodied, whatever that stuff was, and the way Christ was embodied after the resurrection, whatever that stuff was. It's corporeal, but it's not what we have now. It's different. It's superior. It's transcendent. It has a whole set of different properties as opposed to what we have now. We're going to put off what we have now, the body of the, of the dust that returns to dust, that is corruptible, and we're going to put on this new body and this different kind of flesh. So just to kind of summarize you know, where, where we are at to this point, think, think about the, the, the chain of thought here. Paul talks about the resurrected Christ okay, being a life-giving spirit, but he also talks about Christ having a heavenly body, and he also talks about him having 
or being the glory, having a body of glory, uh, like the glory of the Lord, all of these, all of these terms again, are complementary. They are synonymous in that respect. Paul is using different terms not to describe different bodies that Jesus, like like a change of clothes. You know, Jesus, you know, he wears this one one day and that one another day. No, all of these phrases are describing essentially the same thing. It is a post-resurrection corporeality. Okay, that's what it is. So the believer, again, the believer's conformity to the image of the the heavenly man, to use Paul's terminology, who is pneuma and who also is glory, that our conformity to that involves receiving and becoming the same kind of body. And again, that's made explicit in Philippians 3.21. So if, if we take, again, Philippians 3.21 at face value, what it says is that Christ's resurrection body is, again, this, this glorious body that, that we saw back in the Old Testament. That's what that stuff is. And that's what we're going to inherit. So we can't think of pneuma just as formless spirit. Now, the Corinthians, of course, and other people asked, well, can we talk about what sort of nature of stuff that that is? And we get that, obviously, in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, throughout the whole passage, you know, beginning in, in, in 35, Paul writes, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish persons, Paul says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. And Paul using an agrarian analogy. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. So Paul's saying, look, you know, lots of things are embodied, you know, but there's different kinds of embodiment. Human, humanity, animal kingdom, you know, plants, all this kind of stuff. It's not just, again, invisible, formless spirit. Things are embodied. Verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, Paul says, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What we have now, what God's given to us now is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, but it is raised in a spiritual body, or a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. It's just a different kind of embodiment, is what he's saying. In, in Paul, when he talks about the glory of the sun, the glory of the stars, you know, being different than other glories and other bodies. Uh, if you remember back to the interview with David Burnett, this is part of glorification thinking more broadly in the Jewish world, that, that the the descendants of Abraham, and that's believers in New Testament language, according to Galatians 3. Uh, if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed. Will, those believers will become like the stars. Now, that doesn't mean we, we turn into a rock and we, we float around and twinkle, okay? What that actually means, again, if you tie that to Paul's language here in, in, in 1 Corinthians, and, this, and Paul brings it up again, he actually references the glory of the stars in verse 41. What it means is we become divine. Okay, it's deification language, it's divinization language, it's glorification language, whatever, whatever term you like, scholars use them all. It's theosis, okay, it's, it's becoming divine. And what that means in turn is that we get new embodiment. And that embodiment is the stuff of which, you know, the gods are made, or the stuff that God was made of when he interacts with humans. Again, this, this glory body that we see referenced in Ezekiel 1 and in Exodus. You know, hey, the, the angel of the Lord, you know, who that was that was Yahweh embodied. That guy was made of something, okay? Is that that's the idea. And whatever whatever he was made of, well that that's that's what, you know, the 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 guy sitting on the throne in Ezekiel 1, that that's that's what he was made of and that's what Jesus resurrection body was made of. And that's what we will be made of. Again, you have to follow the sort of the logic chain, connecting all these ideas and all these passages, again, to, to get this, this, this flavor of divinization when it comes to Paul's, quote, spirit body talk. Now, again, it doesn't really, you know, we, we can't, you know, our propensity here because we're moderns is, well, hey, I'd like, I'd like a DNA sample. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to know what, how many chromosomes that has. Uh, I, I want to know, you know, what, you know, what the genetic material looks like, what the gene sequences are, and all that kind of stuff. Again, these are modern scientific concepts that nobody is aware of and nobody's thinking about 
when they write this stuff, what they're able to communicate is the notion that after death, especially again as believers, but you know, after death, we don't just sort of become electricity. We don't just sort of become formless, substanceless entities. Okay, we are embodied in a new way, and the people living in Jesus' day who actually saw and touched his resurrected body, okay, know that our future embodiment is going to be physical and corporeal. And whatever that body was, that's the one we're going to get. That much they could communicate. And that, again, was not a revolutionary idea in principle. Again, Paul ups the ante like like biblical writers do so often they'll take they'll take something that is conceptually familiar to their readers both Jew and Gentile in this case and and if, if they're Jews again the startling part is that he links it back to the glory the, the embodied glory uh, and he links that to Jesus okay we will be embodied it'll be different than what we have now in fact it will be the body a body like jesus had so the 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 short answer is what is the spiritual body what is celestial flesh you know what what is this it's the body jesus had and it's it's being what that means is it's being made of the same stuff as that body i can't give you the genetic sequence i can't talk in dna terms about it okay because the scripture doesn't as well just know that it speaks of embodiment and being conformed to the image of Christ for Paul, I think this is another big takeaway here, is that it's not just our character. It's not just our internal disposition. Again, being being what, what Jesus' was, so that we don't rebel, we don't sin. And, and all that's true, but it's more than that. Being conformed to the image of Christ is language designed to inform us that you're going to get that body. You're going to get a body just like he had after the resurrection. So in every way, you will be conformed to what he is in every way. Okay, You will have his inner disposition. You will have his body. You will be so like him that you will be, again, fit for this kind of existence. 